Well, good morning, and uh, I'd like to call the Subcommittee on Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection to order. And uh, I appreciate all of our witnesses that will be testifying today before the committee. And at this time, the Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. And again, good morning, and welcome to the Subcommittee. And today's Subcommittee hearings on the outdoor recreation industry. As a current member and former chairman of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, as well as someone who passionately enjoys all outdoor recreation has to offer, I'm very excited to explore the industry with you today. The outdoor recreation industry is both diverse and far-reaching, spanning many of the traditional major U.S. economic sectors. And at the core of the industry is the American consumer. The outdoor recreation industry thrives when Americans are engaged, and now more than ever, we are seeing more Americans getting involved. Every year, millions of Americans across the country go outside and enjoy the great outdoors, whether they're camping, fishing, hiking, hunting, or enjoying many of the other pastime outdoor recreation has to offer. Americans are actively engaged. Increasingly, more and more Americans are prioritizing outdoor recreation and in doing so, helping grow the industry. The vast contributions made by the outdoor recreation to the overall U.S. economy reflect this trend. Americans spend $887 billion in outdoor recreation annually and helping to create 7.6 million jobs and generate almost $125 billion in federal, state, and local st tax revenue. In my home state of Ohio, where residents come to enjoy, to enjoy the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, the McGee Marsh Wildlife Area, and other public de destinations near our beautiful Lake Erie, We've also seen significant economic benefits of outdoor recreation has to offer. Over 53% of all Ohioans participate in outdoor recreation each year. With approximately $17.4 billion spent by consumers <coughs> pardon me, in this industry, outdoor recreation helps create almost 200,000 jobs and $5.1 billion in wages and salaries alone in Ohio. In recognition of the outdoor recreation industry's growing influence, Congress passed the Outdoor Recreation Jobs and Economic Impact last year. Under this law, the Department of Commerce, in consultation with federal agencies, will analyze outdoor recreation's contributions to the nation's gross domestic product. Through this an analysis, all the economic activity generated by manufacturers, retailers, service providers, and thousands of other businesses supporting the outdoor recreation across the country will be quantified and incorporated into an annual federal assessment of the national economy. As a result, the policymakers and stakeholders alike will have the necessary information to make critical decisions that will allow this industry to thrive for generations to come. In addition to economic output, outdoor recreation offers many other benefits. Outdoor recreation helps Americans get fit and lead healthy lives. Whether it be hiking, trail running, rafting, or the like, outdoor recreation offers Americans many opportunities to get outside and be active. Recent studies also suggest that investments in outdoor recreation may, may help reduce crime and improve education throughout our communities. Another example of the positive impact outdoor recreation has on our, our communities that I'm excited to hear about today is Outward Bound's veteran program. Outward Bound combines outdoor group adventures such as canoeing and hiking with, with facilitated therapeutic sessions designed to help build self-confidence, pride, trust, and communication skills that help veterans readjust upon their return. Today, as we gather to discuss the outdoor recreation industry, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how outdoor recreation is driving investment, creating jobs, and promoting in innovation and working to establish more enjoyable consumer experiences through outdoor activities. For many states and communities, outdoor recreation is the cornerstone of economic activity. It creates jobs and generates revenue and spurs vital investments. Our goal is to continue that progress and ensure that the outdoor recreation industry remains a strong pillar in the United States economy. And at this time, I have about a minute left. Are there any members on our side that would like the remainder? The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to comment on the state of Indiana. Obviously, it's a uh, uh, this industry is very important to our state, specifically the RV industry in the northern part of our state. And I'm pleased to see that last year was the best year that that industry has had since the late 1970s. So uh, I appreciate the hearing and look forward to the testimony. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and I yield back the balance of my time. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the 
gentlelady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, let me uh, welcome our colleague, Don Beyer, who is uh, not only um, the sponsor of the bill that we passed last year, the Outdoor Rec Act, but also uh, the co-chair of the Safe Climate uh, Caucus. And I uh, appreciate your being here. Um, I, I, let me just add, Mr. Mullen, I, I recreate in, uh, in Indiana. Um, I have a, a house uh, on, the, on the lake, so it's not just RVs, but it's a wonderful place in Michigan City. Um, the, uh, the outdoor recreation industry is an important part of our economy, and outdoor activities are enjoyed by 144 million Americans every year. Outdoor recreation in the United States thrives because of our tremendous natural resources and diverse landscape. But our natural wonders are under threat from a changing climate and destructive policies um, that, that we've seen by this uh, administration and this Congress. Climate change is already having a noticeable impact. In Chicago, we had sn a snow drought this winter. There was not a single flake of snow in January or February. If we don't act now, winter will become a thing of the past. That means fewer people enjoyed winter sports and fewer sales for the outdoor recreation industry. And summer will be worse too. When summer has become too hot, that discourages Americans from leaving air conditioned buildings to experience the, the, the great outdoors. The actions of the Trump administration and Republicans in Congress are putting outdoor recreation at further risk. President Trump has moved to dismantle the Clean Power Plan to reduce carbon pollution from our power plants. Republicans in the House of Representatives voted to undo limits on methane emissions from drilling on public lands instead of investing in the green economy of the future. They are trying to reverse the progress we've already made. Where leadership from the president is lacking, the private sector is stepping up. Those working in the outdoor recreation industry know the real economic impact of our changing climate, and they have been leaders in the fight against global climate change. In November, REI and Columbia joined 1,000 other companies on a letter to President Trump calling for implementation of, his historic, of the historic Paris Climate Agreement. That letter stated, quote, failure to build a low carbon economy puts American prosperity at risk but the right action now will, not, will, now will create jobs and boost U.S. competitiveness. The success of the outdoor recreation industry relies on protecting the outdoors, starting with our public lands. Yesterday, the Trump administration took first steps to undermine protection for our public lands. I joined the Democratic colleagues. I joined with Democratic colleagues on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Natural Resources Committee to call on the Department of the Interior to explain its review of the Antiquities Act. I hope our Republican colleagues will join us in efforts to make sure that our public lands remain protected. I want to thank all of our witnesses for your work to promote outdoor recreation and to protect our environment and I look forward to hearing from you as we work to ensure that future generations can enjoy America's unparalleled outdoor spaces. I, uh, I have a minute left. I don't know if anyone would like it. Yes, um, Congresswoman Dingell, I yield to you. Thank you, um, Ranking Member Schakowsky. Outdoor recreation is not only a driver for Michigan's economy, it's a way of life. In my state, everyone heads up north to go camping, skiing, fishing, or John Dingle's case, hunting. But I can tell you it wasn't always like that. To give you one example, from 1946 to 1948, 5.9 million gallons of oil products were released annually into the Detroit River. It was one of the most polluted rivers in the country. Pollution was killing thousands of waterfowl every year and threatening the local walleye and perch population. It was a drag on the economy. Today, the river is now home to the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge, our country's only international refuge. The refuge is a huge driver of our local economy and is home to 30 species of waterfowl, 117 kinds of fish, and over 300 species of birds, a huge turnaround in the not-so-distant past. I mentioned the walleye population that was threatened. 
Today, the river is part of the walleye capital of the world, with anglers from across the country coming to the region. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because we passed laws like the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, established the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and dedicated significant resources to cleaning up our air and our water. As we discuss the impact of our outdoor recreation on our economy, I hope the committee will remember the story of the Detroit River, River and will protect the Clean Water Act and will, will strongly support federal investments in cleanup and conservation. Not only helps our environment, it helps our economy as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. And at this time, the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Oregon, is not here. But uh, when he arrives, we will recognize him for his opening statement. And at this time, the chair will recognize for five minutes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is on the effect of outdoor recreation on the U.S. economy. It's an opportunity to celebrate outdoor recreation. Nothing gets families clamoring to be outdoors more than a day at the beach. And in my district, with the beautiful beaches of Monmouth County, tourism was up more than 5% in 2016 due to the great weather we had last summer. When tourism increases, our local economy thrives. This hearing also gives us the opportunity to highlight the clear link between the economy and environmental stewardship. Supporting outdoor recreation means taking meaningful action to protect the environment. If we don't take care of our environment, the benefits of outdoor recreation to the economy and to the American people will vanish. Severe weather events are increasing, having devastating effects on communities across the country. Superstorm Sandy wrecked short towns in New Jersey and badly hurt our economy. The storm caused catastrophic property damage, destructive shoreline erosion, and many deaths. Temperatures are increasing and precipitation patterns are changing. Not only does this affect ski and snowboarding resorts, it leads to water shortages and increases the risk of fires. It also means more heat advisories and air quality warnings, forcing more people to stay indoors and avoid outdoor activities. We're also seeing an increase in vector-borne diseases like Zika as mosquitoes and ticks migrate northward, increasing health risks and again giving people a reason to stay inside. So at the same time as we pay tribute to outdoor recreation's positive effects on our economy, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge existing environmental concerns, including climate change, and consider how recent federal policy initiatives could exacerbate those concerns. It's hard to know where to start. Just yesterday, President Trump issued an executive order instructing a review of national monument designations as an attack on the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante national monument designations by Presidents Obama and Clinton, and perhaps others. This attack comes despite the fact that counties with protected lands have faster economic growth than those without such protections. Therefore, also yesterday, my colleagues and I wrote Interior Secretary to the Interior Secretary seeking to ensure protection of these vital national lands. Then there's the Trump administration and Republican efforts to slash funding for the EPA, the Department of Interior, and other federal agencies that have a mission to keep our water and air clean and federal lands protected and open to the public. Republicans are also attempting to roll back efforts to curb carbon pollution, exit the Paris Agreement, privatize public lands, and allow coal production and oil and gas drilling in national parks. Concerns also have been raised over the decline in international visitors to the United States in response to the administration's travel ban. 35% of international visitors go to national parks and monuments while in the United States. The administration's actions can seriously harm tourism and the outdoor recreation economy. If we want the outdoor recreation industry to thrive, we must protect the land, water, and wildlife resources that are the foundations of outdoor activities. The outdoor recreation economy is dependent on funding for protection of and access to public lands and waters. So while I was pleased that this committee was able to pass the Outdoor Recreation Act last Congress, which elevated the issue of outdoor recreation and gave it the bipartisan support it deserves, I want to stress that there is more work to be done. Damage to the environment leads to damage to outdoor recreation, hurting the U.S. economy. So let's work to address the changing climate and protect our shoreline, streams, and federal lands. Thank you. And I, I don't think anybody else wants my time, so I yield back.
Well, thank you. The uh, gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and that will conclude the member opening statements. The chair would like to remind all members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today and taking the time to testify before the subcommittee. Today's hearing will consist of two panels. Our first witness panel for today's hearing will include the Honorable Don Byer, who is the representative for Virginia's 8th District. The gentleman will not be answering questions today from the subcommittee. The second panel of witnesses will have the opportunity to give opening statements, followed by a round of questions from the committee members. Once we conclude with the opening statement on the first panel, we'll take a brief recess for the second panel to be seated. We appreciate you all being with us today, and at this time, the gentleman from Virginia's 8th District is now recognized for five minutes to give opening statement. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Sub -chair Subcommittee Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Schakowsky, for holding this hearing and for inviting me to be here to give testimony on this really important outdoor recreation. No one ever said the great indoors. Uh, John, John Muir said, uh, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to pray in and play in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. So beyond their impact on our hearts and our minds, our outdoors are powerful economic drivers that give rise to a, a vast outdoor economy. I've had a long relationship with this outdoor economy. I'm glad, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned Outward Bound. I'm a 1971 January graduate of Outward Bound in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I lost 33 pounds in 26 days, eating everything I could find. Um, I started section hiking the Appalachian Trail in 2002. I was always gonna through hike it, but I decided the happy marriage was more important than through hiking the AT. But I'm up to 1,481 miles right now. So as long as you guys keep the calendars and the voting schedule okay, I'll, I'll finish in 2020. My legs, uh, and then it's on to the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide Trail. So people like me, the hikers, bikers, climbers, skiers, snowboarders, RV owners, paddleboarders, we spend billions each year getting outside. To reiterate, Chairman, your numbers, 87 billion in spending, 124 billion in tax revenue, and almost 8 million jobs. And our policy toward public land should reflect this tremendous economic success. So with Representatives Dave Reichert, Peter Welch, Kathy McMorris-Rogers, and I on the House side, and Senators Gardner and Shaheen on the Senate, we recognize this impact when we introduce the Outdoor Rec Act. Incorporating data on such a sizable share of the economy will ensure that we adopt policies which will help foster growth and prosperity. You know, without this data, we're left to wonder about, say, the Appalachian Trail's contributions to the GDP. So back of the napkin math, a good pack goes for at least $200, a good sleepy bag, another $200, an inexpensive one-person tent, 75 bucks, Durable hiking shoes around $120, although mine was much higher. A good headlamp, $27. Pack liner, $45. Swiss Army knife, $16. Trekking pole, $70. We'll let uh, Jeremy talk about how much a good snowboard costs. None of this will even account for clothing, food, basic first aid, cooking supplies, a sleeping pad, or all the technical weather gear. Over 2,200 miles, a through hiker on the Appalachian Trail will eat at countless small town dinners, delis, coffee shops, pizza huts, even rent the occasional room for a night off the trail. And you'll multiply that times 2,700 successful through hikers a year, and you're talking about literally billions of dollars. Um, and though the trail itself is very long, this is just a look at one small portion of our outdoor economy. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, I believe in the importance of data and measurements. As a businessman, you can't manage what you don't measure. And Werner von Heisenberg pointed out that anything that we measure, we change. So these numbers, if we quantify them, it enables us to enact responsible public policy to grow our economy, create jobs, and foster appreciation and enjoyment of our great outdoors. So this is what the Outdoor Rec Act accomplishes by giving the Bureau of Economic Analysis at the Department of Commerce to quantify the value of the outdoor recreation economy. So from the green vistas of the Shenandoah National Park, the boulder fields up on Mount Washington, the ankle-breaking routes on the 100-mile wilderness in Maine, which I traversed last summer. This nation has been blessed with majestic national bounty. But our public lands are much more than beautiful parks. They're also a source of health, both physical and financial. And they're an economic engine that must continue to grow. So again, thanks for allowing me to testify on the importance of outdoor recreation. I've raised four kids and now two grandkids on the simple ethic that no child should be left inside. 
And I know you have a wonderful panel of witnesses who can reinforce why it's so important for us to pay attention to this enormous economic sector. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, thank you. Well, I, I want to thank the gentleman for his testimony today. And as you ratted off all the different things and the costs, I, I'll need you to probably talk to my wife to explain what our credit card bill looks like <laughs> sometimes when I'm out buying and why, I, and why I need it. But I want to thank you again for your testimony and uh, for your love of the outdoors. So thanks for being with us today. At this time, that will conclude our first panel. And at this time, I'd like to ask for our second panel to uh, come up to be seated. And we'll just take a quick recess as they uh, get their seats. Well, thanks very much and welcome back. Uh, thank you again for your patience as, uh, and for all the time for you being with us today. We now move into our second panel for today's hearing. Each witness will be given five minutes for an opening statement followed by a round of questions from our members. For our second panel, we have the following witnesses. Ms. Amy Roberts, Executive Director of the Outdoor Industry Association. Ms. Ginger Mihalik, Executive Director of the Baltimore Chesapeake Bay Outward Bound School at Outward Bound. Mr. Jeffrey Tuzzi, the Vice President of Global Customs and Trade at Columbia Sportswear. Mr. Mark, I, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, is it uh, Berheke? Berheke? Director of Government and Community Affairs at REI. Mr. Jeremy Jones, founder and president at Protect Our Winters, and Mr. James Landers, vice president of government affairs at the Recreation Vehicle Industry Association. Again, we appreciate you all being here today, and we will begin our panel with Ms. Roberts, and you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statements, and you'll see a yellow light comes on. That's the 30-second light, and the red is the, uh, at the five-minute mark. But thanks again for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for calling this hearing today and highlighting the important role of the outdoor recreation industry and America's great outdoors on the United States economy. Outdoor Industry Association is the national trade association for suppliers, manufacturers, and retailers, and we have more than 1,200 members nationwide. Many members of Congress are familiar with our 2012 Outdoor Recreation Economy Report. And those numbers have become the gold standard for measuring outdoor recreation's impact on the U.S. economy. Our new economic report, released just two days ago, shows a very strong and growing sector that is critical to America's economic well-being and the livelihood of Americans. Our 2017 report shows that outdoor recreation contributes $887 billion in consumer spending annually. This means that Americans spend more on outdoor recreation than on pharmaceuticals and gas and fuels combined. 7.6 million American jobs depend on outdoor recreation. Many more American workers are employed by outdoor recreation than by computer technology, construction, finance, or insurance. As a multidimensional economic sector, outdoor recreation fuels employment in other sectors such as manufacturing, finance, retail, transportation, food service, tourism, and travel. 
Demand for advanced outdoor technical apparel, footwear, and equipment drives innovation and entrepreneurialism. It creates jobs for highly skilled workers in diverse fields. The outdoor industry also contributes a combined $125 billion every year in taxes, $60 billion in local and state, and $65 billion in federal tax dollars. Unfortunately, outdoor recreation assets reap very little of that through reinvestment back into our shared public lands and waters, the infrastructure needed for the outdoor recreation economy. Businesses in our industry are no different from businesses in other sectors. They rely on certainty that they can have access to adequate infrastructure to plan their investments and grow jobs. The outdoor activities that the outdoor industry represents are as diverse as the companies who make up our industry. From hiking, hunting, fishing, skiing, biking, surfing, paddling, ATV and off-roading, to snowmobiling, camping, boating, climbing, and horseback riding, there is an outdoor activity for everyone. The growth in our sector makes sense, and our annual Outdoor Foundation participation report shows that outdoor recreation participation grew, adding 1.6 million participants from 2015 to 2016. The report also shows that half of all Americans participated in at least one outdoor recreational activity in 2016. So that equates to 144 million participants who went on a total of 11 billion outdoor outings. And that's a lot of hiking boots and water bottles. Our public lands and waters belong to every American, and they are the foundation of our outdoor recreation economy. Preserving access is imperative to enhancing the industry's economic and social impact and ensuring that every American's ability to get outside, whether close to home or on a weekend adventure. In order to ensure the growth and success of the outdoor recreation economy, policymakers must protect America's public lands and waters. These assets are foundational to our sector. We ask you to invest in local and federal recreation infrastructure and programs to ensure all Americans have access to public lands and waters and to promote outdoor recreation as part of a public po health policy and national economic discussions. Your committee has been integral in the Outdoor Recreation Jobs and Economic Impact Act, which passed last year with bipartisan support by a unanimous vote. And I think that's something to note, that this is a very bipartisan industry. We hope that this official government data will shed light on business and land management policies that can help our, us continue our trend of growth and success. I want to thank the committee on behalf of the outdoor industry as the Bipartisan Rec Act is the first step to elevating awareness about the impact of the outdoor recreation economy. It underscores the imperative for leaders and lawmakers to protect and invest in policies that grow their infrastructure on which outdoor recreation economy is built. Thank you for your time and attention to our growing industry. Thank you very much. And Ms. Mihalik, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Schakowsky for holding this hearing today and good morning to all of the members of the committee. It's an honor to be before you today. My name is Ginger Mihalik, and I'm proud to represent Outward Bound USA at this hearing. For over 75 years, Outward Bound has educated thousands of students in outdoor classrooms across the United States. I'm proud to serve as the Executive Director of the Baltimore Chesapeake Bay Outward Bound School, which is one of 11 schools. We use the wilderness to provide unparalleled opportunities for discovery, personal growth, self-reliance, teamwork, and compassion. This paired with our proven curriculum produces remarkable documented results strength of character, ability to lead, and a desire to serve. Outward Bound schools in Colorado, California, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Nebraska, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, and Pennsylvania use the power of these amazing places to serve over 40,000 students a year. The programs in each of these schools all teach students to be compassionate, resilient leaders that are equipped with the skills needed to improve themselves and our world. Outward Bound schools design programs to respond to the needs of their specific community and the needs of the times. For example, locally, my school responded to violence between police and youth. Nationally, Outward Bound has designed a program specifically to address the needs of veterans returning home. For many veterans, returning home can be as stressful as shipping out. Although they are safely removed from the dangers of war, they are also removed from the routine, the sense of purpose, and camaraderie that their years of service provided. 
experience in conflict zones can cause veterans to lose touch with their skills, to lose confidence in themselves, and to disengage from the families and communities that welcome them home. Our week-long Outward Bound Veterans expeditions provide a unique setting with physical and mental challenges which create a sense of purpose and accomplishment while building trust in other members of the expedition. In 2016, we were able to take 553 veterans on 47 wilderness expeditions, which included everything from rafting in Oregon to backpacking and rock climbing on the Appalachian Trail to dog sledding in Minnesota. Over the course of each trip, veterans work in a group to overcome shared obstacles and achieve shared goals in a non-combat setting, which helps to build the skills and connections needed to transition back to life at home. Results of a recent study at, univers at the University of Texas show that our veterans program helps to increase overall mental health, interpersonal relations, resilience, sense of purpose, and greater interest in personal growth. Many returning veterans are reticent to seek help through traditional mental health avenues, and Outward Bound Veterans has pr proven to be an effective therapeutic alternative. We at Outward Bound share a belief with this subcommittee. Outdoor recreation provides a space for self-discovery. I have witnessed truly remarkable transformations happen among our students in the outdoors. I've watched an inner city youth view the horizon for the first time. I've watched grown men cry at the beauty of a wilderness sunrise, and I've witnessed a veteran who had lost his legs in war, find himself and his ability to lead again at the stern of a canoe on the Potomac River. As a double amputee, he'd lost his confidence in what he was able to do and believed that he could never complete an expedition. Once in his canoe, he soared. He was the strongest paddler. He quickly found his rhythm in the boat. He had the support of his crew on land, and he ultimately found the confidence he'd lost. These experiences are powerful and are impossible to recreate in any other place than the outdoors. Thank you again, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Schakowsky for the invitation to be here today. I look forward to answering any questions. Well, thank you very much and again, thanks for being with us today. And Mr. Atuzzi, you were recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Schakowsky and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify on matters of importance to the 142 million Americas, Americans who recreate outdoors each year and the compelling numbers that you've already shared with us and, and Amy shared as well uh, from the updated Outdoor Recreation Economy Report released just a couple days ago. I'm proud to be here today on behalf of Columbia Sportswear Company based in the beautiful Pacific Northwest and in the great state of Oregon. I currently serve as Vice President of Global Customs and Trade and have been with the company for over 16 years. Columbia Sportswear Company is a true American business success story that parallels the evolution of outdoor recreation as a vital and integral part of American culture and America's economy. What began in 1938 as a small company purchased by a family that had just immigrated from Nazi Germany, it's grown to become a global leader in the outdoor recreation industry with $2.4 billion in annual sales and supporting over 4,200 jobs across 38 states and an additional 2,300 jobs across the globe. In 2016, the company ranked number 882 on the Fortune 1000, and next year the company will celebrate its 20th anniversary as a publicly traded company. While most people are very familiar with uh, our Columbia Sportswear flagship brand, uh, many are less aware that the company's brand portfolio also includes Mountain Hardware, Sorel, and Prana. Each of our brands targets specific consumer segments within the outdoor recreation industry. Columbia Sportswear Company's rich heritage features stories lines of immigration, entrepreneurship, innovation, and perseverance. Today, the company's four brands in respect to 4,200 hardworking American employees pursue a single unified mission. We connect active people with their passions. We do that by designing innovative performance apparel, footwear, and accessories that enable people to enjoy the endless variety of healthy outdoor recreational activities available across this great nation and in any climate, any weather, and any day of the year. We also support the efforts of more than 400 nonprofits around the country that are working to improve access to outdoor spaces and preserve the natural beauty of our parks, trails, and wetlands so that they'll be there for the next generations to enjoy. We pride ourselves on designing products that deliver real performance benefits and accessible prices that put them within reach of consumers at all income levels. However, unlike many of the other 90 countries where our products are sold, the United States assesses among the highest import tariffs on our categories of products, making them more expensive for U.S. consumers than they would otherwise need to be. 
and also stifling innovation of new, highly technical and high-performance products and hampering our ability to keep our prices within reach of the broadcast con broadest consumer base possible. In fact, U.S. duty rates on our products typically range from 7.1% to as high as 67.5%, with an overall average, uh, industry average of approximately 15%. These duties in the U.S. date back to the 1930s and are no longer relevant as means to protect manufacturing jobs that migrated to other countries more than 30 years ago. Yet to this day, the apparel and footwear industry, and especially the outdoor industry, pays a disproportionate share of the U.S. duties. For example, the amount of duties paid by Columbia Sportswear Company in 2016 ranked at 49th out of 375,000 importers, U.S. importers. We would much rather rank number 49 on the Fortune 1000. We and all of the thousands of companies in the outdoor recreation industry are trying to expand the market of our products and promote increased outdoor recreation. But we are hindered by these high tariffs and in our ability to invest in more family wage U.S. jobs, such as uh, product innovation, design development, supply chain operations, digital commerce, marketing, finance, legal, human resources, and several other critical functions of our companies. We encourage Congress to reevaluate and modernize the outdated and antiquated duty structure in order to bring it current with today's global market realities and to help ease the unnecessary cost burden that is being borne by the outdoor recreation industry and American consumers. We're proud to be a leader in the outdoor recreation industry, an industry that embraces values that are foundational to America's heritage, its culture, and to ensuring a thriving future for all Americans. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Bereka. You are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Schakowsky, members of the subcommittee. Again, thanks for the chance to testify on behalf of REI Co-op. I'm proud to appear alongside my recreation industry colleagues and share the great news about our <coughs> sector's economic impact. REI was founded almost 80 years ago as a co-op in Seattle when 23 climbers came together to get good deals on climbing axes from Europe and other great gear. Today, REI has 145 stores in 36 states, plus over 16 million co-op members across the country. We buy gear and apparel from over 1,000 firms distributed across the United States, and we get thousands more Americans into the outdoors with classes, outings, adventure travel trips. If there are two thoughts I want to leave with you today, they are these. First, the more we understand about the outdoor sector, the more we can create jobs and opportunity. Second, the outdoors significantly enhances all Americans' quality of life and contributes to a stronger America overall. As a jumping off point, on behalf of the co-ops members, let me profoundly thank the committee for passing the Outdoor Rec Act last year. It will assure that the United States measures our sector's contributions with more authority and with more detail. This law, this new law, is foundational to our path forward. My industry colleagues have spoken to the latest economic assessment. I won't repeat those details, but let me say that in my experience, whenever we share this data, policymakers are hungry to learn how we can use the data for economic development. The outdoor sector has so many positive economic attributes. We're made up of thousands of Main Street and entrepreneurial businesses. We have prominent brands like REI, but the reality is our jobs are spread across businesses large and small. In rural towns, it's often the case that recreation is the economic lifeblood. We're also an innovative sector, and in this country, we consider ourselves the hotbed of innovation in outdoor products across the globe. Back in Seattle, REI employs designers, specialists in material science, specialists in advanced manufacturing. We also buy dozens of hot, innovative products from those who are working on outdoor electronics, high-tech apparel, advanced camping gear. We also run a sustainable business. In REI's own operations, we work to minimize our environmental impact. Since the year 2008, we've grown revenue by 78%, over that entire period, our energy consumption has gone up by less than 5%. We're also now 100% powered by renewable energy. We invest in nonprofits, volunteerism, consumer education, 
to protect the public lands because healthy public lands are the infrastructure that our sector relies on. Policymakers want to learn how to create these innovative Main Street entrepreneurial businesses. For instance, I know of economic development activities bubbling away in Arkansas, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. With data generated by the REC Act, we should be able to develop our economy, our REC economy, even faster. So again, thank you for your work on the legislation. We also need to recognize the enormous spillover benefits of outdoor recreation. In some ways, you can think of our sector as adjacent to healthcare, but at the front end. An increasing body of science shows that time outdoors, whether it's exercising or just rejuvenating, it's good for you. It's low cost preventative medicine. In some exciting research that REI has backed at Cal Berkeley, people are finding that time outdoors can mitigate PTSD symptoms in returning vets. Our sector also fosters positive community development. We know that towns with great outdoor uh, opportunities attract businesses, not just outdoor businesses, but businesses of all types. We know that access to safe green spaces in cities makes neighborhoods more cohesive, strengthens the social fabric. We know that when more people walk and bike to jobs or to transit, our transportation networks are more sustainable. Lastly, the outdoors, we should be proud, is also part of healthy childhood development. There's an increasing body of research that shows that kids open their minds in unique ways when they have outdoor opportunities. All of these attributes, in the long run, contribute to a healthier economy, healthier people, healthier communities, and a stronger United States of America. We have limited time here today, but REI looks forward to working with the committee. We're fond of saying that united, we're out, outside, we're united. We look forward to working on these issues in that united spirit. Thank you very much for your testimony today. And at this time, the chair recognizes Mr. Jones for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the Subcommittee on Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection. My name is Jeremy Jones. I'm a professional snowboarder and founder of Protect Our Winners, a nonprofit based in Colorado with over 150,000 members nationwide and the founder of Jones Snowboards, a snowboard company with $8 million in annual sales. Ten years ago, I founded Protect Our Winners because I've spent my life in the mountains and I have witnessed the impacts of climate change on our winters firsthand. Our mission is to engage and mobilize the snow sports industry to lead the fight against climate change. The snow sports community deeply understands the threat that climate change poses on its future. Snowpack is now confined to the highest elevations and what should be falling as snow is in fact falling as rain. Our seasons are noticeably shorter. We understand that if we don't act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we will see the end of winter as we know it. We are pleased that the REC Act passed last year with unanimous bipartisan support. Thank you. Today, I will speak to the importance of environmental protection to ensure a prosperous future for the outdoor recreation economy. As the climate continues to warm our winters, the snow sports industry is increasingly vulnerable. According to the Outdoor Industries Association's 2017 Outdoor Rec Economy Report nationwide, the snow sports industry generates 72 billion annually and supports 695,000 jobs. That means the snow, the snow sports industry is responsible for almost 70,000 more American jobs than our country's extractive industries. Across the United States, average winter temperatures have warmed almost two degrees Fahrenheit since 1895, and that rate of warming has more than tripled since 1970. In the Sierra, where I live, the snowpack is projected to decrease up to 70% by 2050. Ski, resort, ski resorts have lost over $1 billion in revenue and up to 27,000 jobs in low snowfall years the last decade. In recent seasons, 
50% of resorts are both opening late and closing early. By 2010, 88% of resorts report utilizing snowmake to, snowmaking to supplement natural snow cover to stay in business, which adds an additional 500,000 expense to their annual operations. Unfortunately, climate change will decimate far more than the snow sports industry. Our snowpack will not be sufficient to keep stream temperatures low and warmer rivers will diminish fish habitat, making fishing, fishing difficult. In Montana, it is now prohibited to fly fish after 2 p.m. in the summer as the waters are too warm. This rule has devastated the fishing and guiding industry. Our rivers will have less water, reduce, reducing stream flow and making waters harder to navigate for kayaks and canoes. These changes are already impacting rural economies nationwide, and these are communities and places that you represent. From the Oregon Cascades to the headwaters of the Cheat River, from the Sangre de Cristo Range to the shores of Lake Michigan. They rely on outdoor tourism for economic security. I travel the world for my career. The climate change knows no borders. It's the same story everywhere. Early on, my career took me to Chamonix to ride the Valley Blanche, a popular glacier run in France. In 1920, they built a train to take you back to town from the bottom of the glacier. As the glacier receded, they put in a chairlift to take you from the end of the glacier to the train. When I first visited in 1990, it was a 20 minute hike from the end of the glacier to the chairlift. Today, it takes an hour to go from the end of the glacier to the chairlift, which now to the train, which takes you back to town. We know glaciers are receding, but this is occurring at an alarming rate. In the winter of 2010, I hiked up the grassy slopes of an old ski area in British Columbia with a friend. When I asked him why the resort wasn't open, he said, it just doesn't snow here anymore. He's 30 years old. He's seen winter diminish in his lifetime. Now I call Truckee, California home. As the owner of a snowboard company, I run many small businesses that depend on a stable climate and snowy winters. With every inconsistent winter, our community's economy suffers. Thanksgiving traditionally marked the start of winter and my community, um, the start of winter, tourism, tourists are now hesitant to make Christmas plans. This shortens our tourism season and the community from local outfitters to restaurants on Main Street to the resort employees pays the price. Snow is our currency. Snowboarding has led me to a life outdoors. Just like farmers and fishermen, I observe these changes daily for the past 30 years. I'm now a father. I constantly think about a world my son and daughter will grow up in. Climate change is changing places we play right now. In the future, what will these places look like for my kids? Will they experience a lifetime of snowy winters? I'm deeply concerned about the future of outdoor recreation. In this hearing's announcement, Chairman, you said you look forward to hearing how Congress can support the outdoor recreation's economy's growth and viability. I respectably request that you act on climate and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions to ensure the future and prosperity of outdoor recreation. Mr. Jones, thank you very much for your testimony. And Mr. Landers, you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Um, batting clean up today. Um, it is, is that better? Okay. Batting clean up today, yes, uh, Jay Landers um, with the uh, Recreation Vehicle Industry Association. That's the National Trade Association representing all recreation vehicles from the big motor homes all the way down through the whole trailer system, including the little pop-ups and the slide-in campers that go in the back of a pickup truck. So about a year and a half ago, we did our first economic impact study, and what we found, we were really surprised. We, the RV industry generates about $50 billion for the US economy. In that process, we also discovered that we support about 290,000 jobs. And honestly, we are creating jobs faster than we can fill them. All right, think about that. But let me take you back a few years before that. So during the Great Recession, our industry got crushed. It's a disposable, product, disposable income product. So the, the unemployment rate in Elkhart, northern Indiana, was about 20%. I'm happy to report that right now we're at about 3.1%, which is 
virtual un or, uh, full employment. So one of my, as an example, one of my biggest manufacturers, Thor Industries, they are expanding their capacity at four of their plants. More than that, now they're adding six new factories. Each factory is probably 100 to 200 full-time, well-paying jobs. That's in northern Indiana, in, uh, Idaho, Oregon, so various states around the country. And I can tell you they're not alone. There are plenty of other RV manufacturers and suppliers that are expanding. So what's really fueling this growth? Several things. Retail and wholesale credit still readily available. Interest rates are still very reasonable. Consumer sentiment is solid. Gas prices, steady, that's nice. U.S. citizens have choos chosen now to stay home. They're not going abroad as much as they used to be. So staying home and visiting the iconic lands of our country, that's where we'd love to see that. And the last part is the demand is from baby boomers. We know there are about 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. And the other, the other side of that is the millennials. Who knew, right? The millennials are looking at the convenience, the, the, comfort, the comfort, all of the amenities in these new RVs, whether it be a motorhome or a trailer, and they're, they're all about mobility, and that's what we offer. But we really do have some significant challenges. Our research shows that 89% of people buy an RV to go camping at some point. So of the 431,000 units that we put into the stream of commerce last year, that means about 383,000 want to go camping at some point. And that's part of the problem. Um, I can tell you now that the RV-associated overnight stays in the national park system is declining. In the, in the early mid-80s, there were about 4.5 million RV-related stays at the camp, national campgrounds. We're down to about 2 million now. So it's been cut more than half. Why? The biggest reason, we've all heard about this in the news, infrastructure, right? The, the, uh, the federal land agencies haven't invested in their assets. Campgrounds are, are uh, in terrible shape, many of them. Marinas need work, um, the, the supply stores, uh, the bathhouses, the bathing facilities, they all need attention. What we're really looking at is an Eisenhower-era campground system trying to uh, provide needs for the 21st century recreation vehicle, and it's, it's failing, it's just not working. And as crazy as this sounds, the other big want that we've, become, we've come to recognize is both baby boomers and the millennials want Wi-Fi and broadband. I mean, even in the national parks, you, you spend the day out hiking and camping and, and, uh, and walking, snowmobiling. You come back, you want to connect, and especially the young millennials. The other part of this is that the state campground system and the private campground system have invested in their facilities. And so people are choosing to go to the state parks instead of the national parks, and they're going to the private campgrounds because they can get the amenities. So what are we going to do about this? Well, recreation vehicle industry, along with several other, about 13, 18 other our, uh, outdoor recreation uh, trade associations, formed a new trade group, a new coalition called the Outdoor in Recreation Industry Roundtable. And this is the business side. Uh, anything to do with outdoor recreation, it's in this coalition. And what do we want to do? Our charter is really to become a resource and a partner with the federal agencies that deal with outdoor recreation. We want to work with the agencies and Congress on three basic things. Ensure reasonable access to all public lands. We want to establish a system of public-private partnerships. Uh, and specifically for us, of course, we're interested in modernizing and expanding the campgrounds. We also want to encourage the departments to create a culture of yes first, instead of, well, maybe that's not really in my job description. So to wrap up, the RV business is looking good. It's strong. All the indications look like 2017 is going to be even a better year. And we look forward to working with our fellow outdoor recreation industry roundtable partners to work with federal agencies, making sure that all outdoor recreation experiences are met and, in fact, exceeded. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. I thank all of our witnesses for testifying before the subcommittee today. And I will uh, recognize myself uh, to begin the questions.
And if I may, uh, uh, Ms. Roberts, I'd like to, to start with some questions or a question to you. I found it, first of all, interesting your testimony and some of the, in all of the statistics that you quoted, especially how things have really, the exponential number changes, like from 2012 for the industry uh, of uh, $646 billion, and then that changing to, in just in five years' time, to $887 billion, and also the uh, $125 billion in taxes uh, and just on what we're looking at that the industry's generated out there. So I guess when you, we look at all this information, how, do you th how does this information that we gather from the Outdoor Rec Act, will, how is that gonna affect the industry as it moves forward and what do you think the role should be that we as poly policymakers should have then? Thank you for the question, Chairman Latta. Um, the growth, I, you know, the growth in the number between the 2012 report and the 2017 report really shows the growth in our industry over time. The other thing that occurred is that this, it, this report has really become the gold standard for how outdoor recreation is viewed, and so we're always approached to, new, to add new activity categories, which we did in the report. So, and then the other interesting um, bit of information is just that the sample size for this report was actually quite a lot bigger, 70% larger than in our 2012 report. And so looking ahead, that's actually going to allow us to release data in the next six months that shows um, the economic impact, jobs created, taxes paid at the congressional district level, which I think will be very informative as local communities and as this um, body and members of Congress think about how do you develop an outdoor recreation economy in your local community and for that, for us, that really means investing in outdoor recreation infrastructure, investing in public lands, ensuring that the facilities are there when Americans get outside to recreate, that they have places to go. And I think that's both places to go near their home so that outdoor recreation is a part of everyone's lives. Our goal is really to have an outdoor recreation opportunity within 10 minutes of everyone's homes as well as that people can aspire for the bigger adventures on the weekend. So we really are looking for both local policymakers, state policymakers, and then the federal government to see our economy as a growth sector, as uniquely American. These jobs are not easily outsourced. We're going to take advantage of our um, amazing natural resources that are here in the U.S. and as a way to drive opportunity for rural communities, but also urban areas. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mihalik, if I could ask uh, a couple of questions for you. Could you explain the program model that you use for Outward Bound to help our veterans and service members as they uh, come back to their respective communities? And, and really, I want to thank you for all that you're doing for our veterans out there. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, thank you for the question. So Outward Bound has a curriculum that has been developed since 1941 when Outward Bound was founded in Wales, came to the United States and Colorado in 67, and we've used the same model that entire time. It's evolved a little bit over time, but essentially you're taking a group of people, and it could be veterans, it could be youth, it could be a, a, any adult, out into a wilderness setting, and there's an intentional progression that the crew goes through in order to learn new skills. With veterans, um, it can be a little more unique, our instructors receive a lot of additional training on how to deal with the issues that they're working through, but you take them through three phases of a course, there's training main, final, where you're trying to teach them the skills that they're gonna need out in real life, but in a wilderness setting, um, things like communication, how do you support each other, how do you ask for what you need. Um, the veterans find as they are on these courses together, they get to practice those skills in a setting that is familiar to them. It's much like being in a war setting. They're in the trenches with their crew. They get to work through those skills, and then they learn how to transfer them back to their day-to-day -day life. Thank you. Sure. And if I could turn to you, Mr. Berhaika. In your testimony, you mentioned that the outdoor recreation is an innovative sector. Can you highlight some of the innovations that come from this space and speak to the advancements and technologies that are being used to enhance outdoor recreation gear and apparel? Sure. Uh, in fact, my buddy Jeff here probably has an example on the chair. Uh, they've invented a water repellent jacket that uses recycled materials and that is, uh, imposes limited harm on the environment. One of the things we're very conscientious of as we produce these products is not just how we assemble them, but what their end of life is. And so REI awarded Columbia 
our first ever Root Award for uh, inventing the most sustainable jack water repellent jacket we've ever seen. That's just one example. Well, thank you very much. And my time has expired, and at this time I'll recognize the general lady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for, I want to take this opportunity. Today is Take Your Daughters to Work today, and I just wanted to uh, introduce my adopted daughter for the day, uh, Elena Tate. Stand up for one second. Okay, Girls Inc. Um, behind me, and also um, acknowledge uh, Lizzie Carroll, who's here, um, Lizzie. Um, Jeff Carroll, our uh, uh, chief of staff for the Democrats, his daughter. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, kids. Um, I also wanted to uh, apologize, though he's not here, to Mr. Bouchon, who I called Mr. Mullen um, earlier, uh, my colleague in uh, Indiana next to uh, to where I have a home and next to my district. So um, let, let me uh, talk a little bit about the environment, and I appreciate the emphasis on environment that we heard from everyone um, from the standpoint very much of um, economics in our country, which I think sometimes we don't really think about. I was really interested in the statistics as Roberts and uh, Mr. Jones talked a, a bit about that, all of you really, about the contribution to our economy that is really dependent on our, um, on our environment and then concerns about the, uh, the changing in environment. And so I, I want to turn to our witnesses and I wanted to, to start. Um, Mr. Um, now I'm going to try it. Uh, I have Burekow. Bureka. It's, oh, it's a, Bureka. It's a good okay. Uh, okay. Bureka. Chicago Polish name. Okay. I shouldn't have Chicago, I should know that. But uh, Polish Lithuanian. Yeah. Um, so how concerned um, is your company then about the uh, effect of climate change on the future stability and economic growth of the uh, of the industry and your business in particular? I, I think REI uh, co-op identified climate change as a business risk probably 10 to 15 years ago. And so, like the rest of the panelists, we're concerned that uh, with a changing climate comes hotter, longer summers, uh, as well as shorter winters. And that can affect the economic vitality of the industry, for sure. Mr. Tuzzi, I wondered if you wanted to talk about that at all. I know you were talking about tariffs, and I want to talk about the climate. Sure. <laughs> well, thank you. I Appreciate that uh, ranking member. Uh, I think one way ours is pretty easy. You know, we make products to to adapt to all these changes. Um, we produce in uh, over 90 countries around the world in a multitude of climates, and uh, we rely on the associations and whatnot to help uh, address the things in a more macro level. And then we make sure we protect our consumers. We kind of have this: we keep our uh, consumers warm, dry, cool, and protected. And then I think, you know, we also have to align our values with, with our consumers. And Mark was just talking about this, this jacket here, which we've won lots of awards on, and it's, it's actually waterproof, uh, breathable, not just water resistant. Does it come in any other colors? <laughs> just ask. <laughs> I, I, never mind. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually made from uh, 21 water bottles. It saved 13, this ja uh, one jacket saves 13 gallons of water because there's no dye used in the process. It's PFG free and it's still waterproof, breathable, very protective. And I think it's, it's just a good, and it's recyclable. So it's a good, uh, good showcase of what, of what we try to do as a brand to adapt to that. And support that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, um, many, many of the business leaders in our outdoor recreation industry recognize the threat of, of climate change. And since 2013, more than 1,000 companies have signed the climate declaration as a call to action. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, request unanimous consent to introduce a copy of this declaration for the record, including a list of the signatories from the outdoor industry. Let me just say uh, one sentence um, here that I thought I marked. There must be a coordinated effort to combat climate change with America taking the lead here at home. 
Leading is what we've always done, and by working together, regardless of politics, we'll do it again. Um, and I know the uh, Outdoor Industry Association is listed here, and I'm um, hopeful that, uh, is, are all of you on this? I don't know, anybody? Okay, um, I, I, uh, I'm just about um, out of time, but I did want to um, say to Mr. Jones, so, are you concerned by efforts to slash funding for the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Interior, and other federal agencies with important missions regarding outdoor recreation? It's incredibly disheartening. Uh, I feel like, you know, the EPA, uh, for example, is a great example of an agency formed by a Republican um, that with bipartisan support and to see this become a um, political issue, I think it's been a huge problem. Um, and we're really at this 11th hour, we have um, the solutions uh, we're, we, and we just need to embrace them. And we need bipartisan support to do that. And at a time when the EPA couldn't be more important to see uh, 15,000 jobs potentially get slashed is uh, really scary. Thank you. Um, I yield back. Thank you. And the, uh, without objection, the general lady's letter will be uh, accepted for the record. At this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman, the vice chairman from Mississippi, for five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for being here, and this is such an important issue in, in every state, very important in my home state of Mississippi. Uh, we have some uh, great um, uh, homegrown uh, success stories, uh, companies such as uh, Drake uh, and others like Longleaf and Mossy Oak that have really uh, done a great job in, uh, in this area uh, for consumers. And uh, Ms. Mahalik, I want to also thank you for the work with veterans. Uh, that's uh, very important. And for me personally, uh, as a parent of a child with special needs who is 27 and has uh, intellectual disabilities, has fragile X syndrome, uh, this, this is an important area too for us. Uh, and so we look at ways and encourage you as we look at things, how we make sure that they're included uh, uh, in your calculations on, on doing these things. So. Uh, it, at this time, Ms. Roberts, can I ask you a, a couple of questions, if I may? Uh, what role do you believe that we play as policymakers to ensure continued growth and success of uh, outdoor recreation? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, you know, I do really think it is, you know, a few things. One is ensuring that we keep our public lands public and so that they're accessible by all Americans and Americans have the opportunity to go out and enjoy our natural resources. I think it is funding, uh, providing adequate funding for the land management agencies. Um, so we do support full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and then adequate funding so that our lands are properly managed and that when Americans go out and they enjoy, whether it's to a national park, the BLM lands, Forest Service lands, they have an opportunity to have a great experience. To Jeff's, or to, um, yeah, Jeff's comments, um, specific to um, really the business side, it really is looking at some of the outdated tariff codes and ensuring that our products are properly classified and that we do look at reducing tariffs on products that are no longer made in the U.S. so that consumers have the opportunity to access our products, our products remain affordable, and I do think that would help drive the innovation that Columbia Sportswear, REI, other companies are doing in terms of product innovation. That's both on the sustainability side, some of the areas that Jeff talked about, as well as um, innovation around just our own operations. So those are some of the things that I feel um, Congress can do. Okay, thank you very much. And, and Mr. Landers, I agree that uh, having enjoyed uh, traveling with friends on occasion and in, uh, in a motor coach or motor home, um, it's, uh, it's, it's great if you're, unless you're the driver. If you're, uh, if you're getting to ride on one, it's, uh, it's a great experience, great opportunity. And the infrastructure issue is an important one that we face in this country. Uh, so are you seeing development, and I know your, your concern is the 
outdated infrastructure within our national parks and, and uh, certainly state parks. Are you seeing development on the private side that's maybe compensating for that and accounting for any of the reduced numbers that you stated? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> when you think about a, a private campground, that, that's a, that is an entrepreneur who has started that business. They are going to invest in that business to get bigger, get better. Uh, I, I would venture to say that almost every private campground has Wi-Fi right now. And it has broadband. So, uh, and, and if you shift to the states, we know that some states uh, are investing heavily in their park system because it's a cash cow. It can be. Sure. Um, so, yeah, for the states, they're doing the right thing. The privates are all over this. Um, and unfortunately, at the national level, it, it, we need, it, the, need help. They need help. Okay. They need attention. Right. And, the, and really, one of the biggest solutions, the potential solution, is uh, offering public-private partnerships where you know we can do things together uh, and at a faster pace. Thank you, uh, Mr. Berica. If I could ask you, did I come close on the pronunciation? You did. Here? Okay. We're get, we're honing right. in on it. All right, that's close. <laughs> we're we're in the zip right zip code. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in your testimony, you touch on the uh, spillover benefits of outdoor recreation. Can you explain the benefits uh, American consumers and participants will see, uh, as well as how outdoor recreations help other economic sectors? Sure. Um, to elaborate on a couple points in the testimony, one, um, like the folks at Outward Bound, we're very excited about uh, the health benefits of time outdoors, and in particular, time outdoors as it... Um, might uh, address mental health needs. The research we're funding in California is looking at PTSD sufferers, and PTSD sufferers in particular um, uh, enjoy enormous uh, reductions in stress and anxiety from outdoor experiences. I like to think of uh, getting folks like PTSD sufferers access to more hiking and biking and fewer pills and treadmills. Yes, if the American taxpayers spend less on pills for PTSD sufferers and more on getting them hiking, We'll all be better off. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, each of your testimony. Yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a coastal district, so the outdoor recreation industry is very important to the communities I represent. So I, my questions are of um, Ms. Roberts. Your organization just released a report that highlights the role of beaches and beach-going activities for state and local economies. Could you just briefly share some of your findings on the economic role of uh, the outdoor recreation industry for beach communities? Thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the areas of growth in the report from the 2012 report to 2017 was were really the water-based activities that we added. So we added sailing, surfing, um, other activities like that, and I think some of the reasons behind why we decided to add those activities has been the growth in those activities, the popularity of those activities, um, the broadening, the crossover between um, some of the water-based sports in the past. I think one thing you've really seen is the growth of stand-up paddle, and so we've starting to see more accessibility into those types of water-based activities from beginner to the more advanced surfing. And that was the decision making behind our process in terms of adding those activities. And the, I think the thing there as well is just as these communities along the ocean start to transition economies and think about you know, how do you grow your economy in the 21st century, we're starting to see more and more communities invest in tourism and recreation infrastructure that support Americans coming to those areas to recreate. Well, thank you. Now, in my district, we're fortunate to have the Gateway National Recreation Area, which includes Sandy Hook, which is a seven-mile stretch of coastline that hosts over two million visitors to its public beaches every year. According to the National Park Service, Gateway National Recreation Area generated more than $247 million in economic output in 2016. But the problem is the sea level is already rising at Sandy Hook, and predictions call for as much as six feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. Modeling by the Union of Concerned Scientists shows that with that much rise, most of Sandy Hook will flood every day. And that's just one example. So Ms. Roberts, what might the economic effects be for the outdoor recreation industry from rising sea levels and loss of coastline from climate change? Thank you, we, we are concerned about that. 
And we do feel, um, we do feel that Congress should take action to enact policy instruments that, in, that combat climate change. At the same time, um, we're working at the state and local level to talk with local policymakers, state legislatures about what can be done. So I think there's both enacting pol policy instruments that reduce carbon, and I think it's also incentivizing cleaner economies, um, solar, these other, um, inst these other fewer carbon emission, emission producing um, energy development. So that, those are the things we're looking at. I would say the other thing is that our industry is also doing its part in terms of our own operations. So whether or not that's producing more sustainable products, it's also thinking about our own operations as we transport product, as we build distribution centers. So the discussion within the outdoor industry is both how do we reduce our own carbon footprint, but also how do we advocate for climate policies that transition our economy to a cleaner sector. Oh, thank you. Let me ask you one more question. Climate change is not the only threat to our national, to our natural environment and outdoor recreation. In the first hundred days of the Trump presidency, we've seen numerous attacks on the environment that threaten public health, ecosystems, and the outdoor recreation industry. In February, President Trump signed the repeal of the stream encroachment rule, and this rule had protected streams near surface coal mining operations, like mountaintop removal mines, from heavy metal contamination. What are some popular outdoor recreation activities that make use of rivers and streams and can poor water quality impair those activities or make them less popular? Thank you. Yeah, the activities that we have highlighted in our report would include um, any water-based activities, so it could be paddling, canoeing, and then of course uh, fly fishing. So those are some of the activities that use streams and are dependent on clean waters. All right. I mean, the rule that Trump repealed would have protected or restored nearly 6,000 miles of streams and 52,000 acres of forest over two decades. And those areas have, in my opinion, a measurable ecological value and huge and economic value as well. So thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Landers, uh, in your testimony, you said that uh, in 2016, the RV industry, and we talked before, as, as, as the best year since the late 90s, 1970s. Uh, why do you think the industry had such a remarkable, remarkable comeback, and what do you kind of attribute that, that success to? Uh, thank you, Dr. Bersan. Um, well, I, I elaborated on some of the, the points, the interest rates are low, and but you know, one of the other portions that I didn't mention was the fact that we've got a, we have a 20 year old advertising program called Go RVing. And while it's focused on uh, some television and video, we are now all over the social media platforms. And again, this is driving not only um, the baby boomers, but we're, we're opening up all sorts of markets with the Hispanic market, with the African-American market, and the millennials and the Gen Xers. So um, honestly, we cannot build recreation vehicles fast enough to, few, to satisfy the demand. So you think it's probably a, a, really a big cultural shift almost in thought process of, in the 1970s, I mean, I, we had campers and every weekend we went to the lake. And, 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 but I haven't done that in my own life. I had other things to do, but maybe my kids are starting to do that, right? So it's a, maybe people are recognizing, the, again, the, the, the benefits of being out, out there and how much, how much it's enjoyable, how enjoyable it is. Right. When you look at the campers uh, from back in the 70s and 80s to the ones now, I mean, you, now you're pushing a button and virtually both entire walls can expand. So some of the campsites that are in the, in the campgrounds are not wide enough any longer. Um, and, so, and some of the vehicles are longer, so you need the pull-through sites instead of trying to back something in there. Um, um, but I, I think that, um, on the whole, they, uh, recreation vehicles now offer all of the conveniences that you have in your house. Uh, some of these vehicles are extremely expensive, but most of them are really very affordable. And what we're finding is that more people are uh, deciding to uh, stay home. You know, if you, if you went and you took a family of four and you flew somewhere, you're paying for the airfare, then you're renting a car, and then you're eating at a, 
a restaurant every day and you're staying at the hotels and you've got all that in a recreation vehicle. And leading into that, then are there any barriers, you know, governmental barriers or other things that you see in the future as it relates to whether it's technological advances or other things that you see that Washington, D.C. can potentially be help, helpful to you all in your industry to further advance and expand your, your business? Well, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's funny you ask that because it was just last week we ended up having a meeting with NHTSA because uh, my own concern is the uh, autonomous vehicle industry is moving along very quickly, and I personally feel like we're going to be there before you know it. And I didn't want the industry to get caught behind, and so uh, invariably we get caught up in automobile, truck, bus, housing legislation, regulations, but it's time for us to kind of get out a little bit further in front of, you know, everybody's got this image of wouldn't it be fabulous to get in an RV and then pre-program it and go in the back and have a, a, a sandwich and watch a game. Uh, that would be nice. That would be nice. <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but we're on the way, and um, we want to work with the Congress, with NHTSA, with everybody to make Good, sure. Good, and that's, that's appropriate. I'm glad you said that because this subcommittee is, has, has been having some hearings on autonomous vehicles, and so the, um, the inclusion of your industry in that overall discussion may be something that comes out of this hearing, and, and, and uh, I appreciate that. So, M Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. And the chair now recognizes the lady from the Great Lake State for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Michigan's got, I, I have been on a camper. I, we lived in, and my best friend now, whose husband owns hockey teams and started, it lived, will only travel by recreational vehicle. And I'm going to tell her I made that point today. But Michigan's got over 200,000 snowmobile trail permits and expenditures on snowmobiling equipment, which totals $235 million. We have more hunters than any other state, and Lord knows I'm married to one of them. And they contribute, we don't agree on that one issue, and they contribute $304 million to local economies while hunting. That is a good thing. We have 3.9 million acres of state forest, 150 state forest campgrounds, thousands of miles of trails, 7,500 miles of river, and hundreds of miles of Great Lakes shoreline. So we obviously agree with all of you and, and, and care deeply. Certain policies, we are worried about what's happening here in Washington, though, and um, how we make sure that we're not putting outdoor tourism, uh, the outdoor tourism economy in jeopardy. Ms. Roberts. In your testimony, you state that protecting America's public lands and waters are essential to ensuring the growth and success of the outdoor recreation economy. Would you agree that investing in conservation programs such as the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has a positive impact on jobs? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we would agree with that. So the president's budget would proposal looks to eliminate $300 million in spending on the GLRI. Would zeroing that out budget hurt us both economically and environmentally? We are concerned with um, proposed cuts to the Department of Interior and the uh, Department of Ag, the Forest Service. Obviously, we're interested in the Forest Service recreation. Um, we would also um, encourage Congress to think about how we're currently funding wildfires. And we think about changing that, and there are several bills um, that have bipartisan support that would ensure that we don't take away from our recreational accounts to fund wildfires. So we do feel that adequate funding um, by Congress is important to helping our economy continue to grow. And could be heard if we didn't. Yes, thank you. Mr. Jones. In your testimony, you state that climate change will decimate not only your industry, but other industries, as snowpacks will not be sufficient to keep stream temperatures low. What can Congress do to help mitigate man-made climate change? And then I'm going to get political and really say, should we remain in the Paris Agreement? Yeah, I mean, I guess to end where you, or start where you ended, um, I mean, we need bipartisan support for real action on climate. We believe it's a jobs uh, producer acting on climate. 
to not be in the Paris Agreement along with 195 other countries is, would be very bad. Um, so in short, I mean, our goal would, our goal is to have real action from our elected officials to act on climate and it's, yeah, we're just, it's very hard to, um, I feel like we're, we're, we look really short term right now and we are behind and we're losing um, jobs because of it and this issue is not going away. It's, uh, it's astonishing, I talked about this ski area um, in my testimony in Canada where this guy had basically lost his ski area to climate change, it no longer snows. And, and that was uh, 12 years ago. And I thought like, well, that, I don't have an issue in my town on that. We've never not been able to open. And we're just coming off a four year drought where we virtually couldn't open the bottom of the mountain. So um, real definitive action on climate at a policy level would be huge. Thank you. I've only got a few seconds. So Ms. Roberts, I'm gonna ask you about the Land and Water Conservation Fund which was created in the 60s, probably by somebody I know and love, which has provided recreation access, secured key wildlife habitat, and protected the very outdoor resources that we're talking about today, hunting, fishing, hiking. Can you tell me uh, what your companies are saying and how you view the connection between that key program and the economic contributions your industry makes, please, in nine seconds? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, we um, had about 120 of our industry executives in town over the last couple of days and advocating on behalf of the Land and Water Conservation Fund was a major effort and a major ask in all of those meetings. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I still wanna tell you my favorite thing when I wanna escape from this place, which is more often lately, is floating down the river in the inner tube, which none of you talked about. And I did every <laughs> single day as a kid. And your parents would kill you for like going out in the buoy and waiting for the freighter and going in the wake. It was great. Well, thank you very much. I, the gentlelady yields back and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Well, picking up where Ms. Dingle went off, whether it's her floating down the river or a lot of people wanting to throw us all in the river, <laughs> I think there's probably some similarities there, but um, uh, disposing of the levity there, let me uh, ask a question of the panel with a little bit of context. Um, outdoor recreation is so diverse in scope and it means so much and I think that that's why it's so important to our country because people look at it and utilize it in many different ways. A good example in my district, uh, the Schuylkill River National Heritage Area, uh, for many years a portion of the Schuylkill River that runs through my district from Valley Forge National Park uh, uh, west towards the cent central part of the state uh, had fallen victim to neglect, but through a, efforts of dedicated community leaders and volunteers, the, the area was transformed. Today, that National Heritage Area generates nearly 590 million annually and supports over 6,000 jobs. The resurgence of the health of the Schuylkill River and the connected landscape is a core reason outdoor recreation is flourishing in communities in my district. The commitment to revitalize the natural resources through the restoration of the Schuylkill River and the River Tr Schuylkill River Trail has given the region improved recreational assets and has been a trigger for economic development. Whether it's the free bike sharing program in the state of Pennsylvania, which um, was one of the first uh, in the state, uh, or kayak, rental shops, fishing stores, restaurants, and hotels, which have sprung up as a result. Uh, there is a host of public policy considerations, which I'd like you to share with me as to what we need to focus on as policymakers. Community planning, uh, infrastructure, we passed a water infrastructure bill, which I think is very critical. Uh, certain environmental protections, Ms. Dingle uh, mentioned the LWCF, which I and many others are strong supportive, supportive of uh, from a uh, recreational resource perspective. Mr. Bouchon mentioned how technology is playing an increasing role in the outdoor uh, recreational uh, movement. Uh, the role of riparian uh, corridor buffers um, 
And so here's my question. The, the multidimensional nature of outdoor recreation does fuel employment in a variety of sectors. Can you explain the positive ripple effects you see with outdoor rec the outdoor recreational industry as a catalyst for economic resurgent, resurgence? And secondly, we talk about leveraging public-private partnerships. That can mean many different things. But with respect to your companies, organizations, and trade associations, how have you worked to employ this dual cooperation, given the unique nature uh, of the outdoor recreational opportunities in any given congressional district? And what can we do to strengthen them? Related to that, what are the challenges that we face to make sure that we're providing an enhanced experience moving forward for all constituents? So I'll keep it open-ended and ask all of you to just weigh in on that topic. Thanks. Well, it, it sounds like uh, there was an investment in the river and the surrounding areas, and it's turned into a job-creating uh, entity and an enjoyment for your local citizens. So what we're advocating as part of the Outdoor Recreation Industry Roundtable is that, yes, uh, these are assets, and when invested in them, they're, they're, it's a cash cow. It's a positive return. So we're, we're trying to work with interior and agriculture to encourage them to uh, work with us and, and, and generate some public-private partnership opportunities uh, to get a better return. So I'll tell you one quick story that, uh, that I heard over the last couple of days. The, uh, the Blue River in Colorado is part of the Forest Service campground uh, inventory. And they ended up closing, it was, it, was, it was making money and it was great, but they ended up closing that whole ca uh, campground because the beetle kill. And so instead of investing in a few, uh, I I investing money to clear the trees that were causing potential danger, they decided to close the whole thing. So not only did they lose the revenue, they lost the you know, the ability to, they also said, oh, look, we've, we've addressed part of the backlog by taking it off our books. So it was a double whammy. So investing in the facilities and using public-private partnerships is, seems to be the way to go. I'll, I'll weigh in here also on the importance of public-private partnerships. Uh, Jeff spoke to how Columbia supports hundreds of not-for-profits. REI likewise supports hundreds of not-for-profits. Some overlap there, but between the two companies, you know, we're probably north of 500 different not-for-profits that we support around the country. Those not-for-profits aren't just organizations, they're people, and inside, inside the organizations, those people are extremely passionate about whether it's floating down a river or going on an RV trip, and so those nonprofit leaders can often find, and it sounds like this was your experience on this Google, they can find the best places for people to recreate, and then uh, with their volunteerism sort of be the leading edge of recreation infrastructure. But once they're at the leading edge, there's, there's a role for, for government to come in and provide support for the infrastructure. I think all of us agree that um, recreation assets in today's day and age are infrastructure, and it's, it's an important role for government uh, to be there as you consider infrastructure packages to include outdoors as infrastructure. That's a good point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank uh, both Chairman Latta and Ranking Member Chikowski for holding today's hearing. Outdoor recreation, including hiking, uh, fishing, hunting, or Central American traditions. I'm glad that we're taking time today to recognize the economic impact of this industry has and examine our, our, with our panel the benefits of the industry towards conservation. Uh, I have a very urban district in Houston, but, uh, but all of us want to get out in the country because we're in a big city. And um, my experience is I learned to hunt with my father-in-law in fish, and my son and I did the same thing. And, and if I could show it to you, my son and his two of our grandsons in South Texas actually got an alligator last weekend and chose my two grandsons, one of them straddling the alligator. I just hope he didn't use my grandsons as bait. But, uh, but so outdoors is important. And in Texas, uh, in the come late November, early December, 
we see lots of RVs going to South Texas where my son and his family actually live. And there are a lot of winter Texans down there that uh, uh, enjoy this. So it's really important outdoor sports around the country, but particularly where I come from. In the early part of the last century, many wildlife species were dwindling in numbers around our country. And at the behest of the firearms industry, Congress imposed an excise tax on the sale of firearms and ammunition products known as the Pittman-Robinson Act. Since its enactment, $11 billion has been distributed to states for conservation, outdoor education under Pittman-Robinson, making the firearms industry the largest contributor to con conservation and access. I bring this up because I'm, I'm surprised how many people do not know that hunting and conservation go hand in hand. And I'd like to get a response from uh, any of the panel on the Robinson Pittman because Congress should be reauthorizing it. Anybody have a uh, comment on it? Nope. Tell me about uh, the ways your industry contributes to conservation efforts that most people don't know about. Um, I know REI obviously has a great record. I mean, I could elaborate. We, of those 300 organizations we support, the overwhelming majority are stewardship organizations that go into um, favorite places to recreate, and they do the trail cleaning, they do the trail maintenance. They're, they're the ones who are at the leading edge often of uh, repairing infrastructure if it's fallen into disrepair. Um, I'll add that for Outward Bound, one of the issues that we have uh, struggled with when we open new course areas, so course areas anywhere, it could be a river, it could be a hiking trail where we want to take people, is often access. Um, so we worked recently with the Chesapeake Conservancy to open a course on the Nanticoke River. There was not access to water, there was not access to campsites, but this is an amazing river in Maryland that people should be able to explore. So we were able to establish partnerships with the Conservancy, which is a conservation organization, um, National Park Service and our local Department of Natural Resources to all come together to be able to open that area. And now we take about 60 kids per year down that river. Anyone else? Going back to the example of Pittman Robinson, one of the areas I have concern about is the aging demographic of sportsmen. If the current trends continue, state wildlife agencies will not be able to rely on the same level of funding as older hunters hang up, hang up their hats and are, aren't replaced by younger hunters. As an industry and as a legislative body, what can we do to ensure that our children and grandchildren have the same access or expanded access to natural resources that we have grown up with? So as part of the outdoor industry's efforts, we have a, a nonprofit called the Outdoor Foundation, and the Outdoor Foundation's mission is to encourage a new generation of youth to get outside and recreate, and that includes all of the activities that we covered in our economic report. And so our industry has come together to fund nonprofits across the country who take kids outside. And one key element that we found early on through really pilot and error is that um, the importance of mentorship and creating an opportunity for that bond to form, whether it's within a family or it's just an older um, person who's experienced, whether in fishing, hunting, rock climbing, any sort of activity that takes a, a youth outside but repeatedly exposes the youth to that experience. That's how you build a lifelong love of these activities. And so what we've done is really bring together all of the industry's resources and then spend time ensuring that um, these local groups ha that are on the ground take these kids outside. And I think that is the most effective way to ensure that we do have the next generation that loves the land, but also loves these activities. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of my time, but if I could give a commercial. I'm a co-chair of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, along with my colleague Jeff Duncan from South Carolina, and we'll soon be introducing the SHARE Act, the Sportsman's Heritage and Recreational Enhancement Act, a compilation of package of bills aimed at improving access to public lands and preserving and expanding sportsman's issues. And um, I'm I appreciate you letting me do the commercial. Very well done commercial too, Mr. Green. Uh, seeing there are no other members here to uh, ask questions for the panel, I wanna thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here and share your insights with us. Before we conclude, I'd like to include the following documents to be submitted for the record by unanimous consent, a letter from Vista Outdoor and a letter from AMA. Uh, seeing no objection, those are admitted. In pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days 
I believe we may have something else we'd like to submit for the record, uh, and I'll recognize the ranking member. Thank you. The uh, Low Carbon USA letter from U.S. businesses and the uh, an EPA fact sheet. And without objection, those are admitted to the record. And pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And I ask that witnesses submit their responses within 10 business days upon receipt of any questions. Without objection, this hearing is adjourned. Okay. These are the, uh, okay. Okay, thanks, Greg.